are we all on the good link, you think? Or... Because we can no, no longer hear the organizers. So maybe the organizers can actually hear us. The organizer disappeared. <laughs> this is strange. It's probably related to streaming, I think. You know, they, they have to stream everything uh, through Facebook or I don't know where. Okay. okay. So start smiling. Well, good morning, uh, everybody. My name is Nikola Borazer. I'm the executive editor of European Western Balkans. It is a great pleasure for me to host you here, uh, virtually at least in Belgrade, for the event uh, Building Europe Together, Western Balkans Contribution to the Conference of the Future of Europe. Uh, this event is organized as a part of the initiative on the Conference of the Future of Europe, which is an EU-wide project aimed at uh, discussing and shaping up uh, the future of the European Union, which we all hope that Western Balkans will become a part of in the near future. Uh, the goal of this event is to bring some recommendations, some ideas on how to, uh, on the one hand, improve the EU accession process, but on the other hand, uh, to contribute as the Western Balkans to the future of the European Union. We have had several events organized around the Western Balkans as a part of the Conference on the Future of Europe. So this event, in a way, represents some kind of a wrap-up, some, kind of some kind of a final event where we are supposed to offer concrete recommendations, which will then be uploaded to the official Conference of the Future of Europe website and be part of, let's say, uh, official recommendations coming from the civil society uh, of, the, of, the, of the Western Balkans. Uh, I have the pleasure of, uh, of hosting here uh, uh, distinguished speakers from uh, all the Western Balkan Six. Here with us we have uh, Mr. Susan Svic, he's the uh, Senior Policy Analyst for the Open Society Foundation uh, in Brussels and a member of BPAG. Uh, Mr. Zora Nechev, who is the uh, Senior Researcher at the Institute for Democracy, Societas Civilis, uh, Skopje and also member of BIEPAG. Then we have Doni Kajamini, the Executive Director of the Civicos platform uh, from Kosovo, also uh, part of BIEPAG. Uh, Ms. Selma Prodanovic, entrepreneur uh, living in Vienna, but originally coming from Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Dalibor Kaujarevic, the Executive Director of the Center for Civic Education from Podgorica, Montenegro, and uh, Ms. Dafina Petsi, the Secretary General of the National Youth Congress of uh, Albania. So welcome, welcome to our event and welcome to, to Belgrade, at least virtually. Um, I will start by giving the floor to Mr. Sojan Svic to hear about his ideas and uh, his uh, position on how can the Western Balkans contribute to the future of Europe. Mr. Twitch, you have the floor. You're on mute, Sasha. Yes. So thank you, Nicola. Uh, uh, I will uh, start my presentation by a little bit of counterfactual history, if you don't mind. So um, in 1974, in July, uh, the Greek military junta ended. And I don't know if you know what happened later when it comes to the process of the European integration of the country. So basically a year later, Greece applied for EU then EEC membership. Six months later in uh, January, 1976, uh, the European Commission gave its opinion to Greece's application. 
it was overall positive, but the European Commission at the time proposed a uh, pre-accession period uh, to be applied uh, to Greece before it starts the actual institutional integration into the EU. Uh, and as a reaction to this uh, perceived the delay, the prime minister of the country at the time and its government, Sokara Mali, started intense lobbying towards all nine at the time EU member states, focusing on France and Germany, uh, to basically accelerate the process of Greece's integration into the EU. And the European Commission's proposal as a result of this uh, advocacy campaign was rejected. And there was no pre-accession period given to Greece. Accession talks started in July 76, and they were concluded in less than three years later. So in May 79, and the Greek parliament ratified the treaty of accession to the EU in June 1979. And by January 81, Greece was a full member of the European Union. But th this is how it went. But imagine it didn't go that way. Uh, imagine that the European Commission was listened to and that the long accession talks with Greece began. Imagine now that, let's say, a new member state opposed to Greece's entry into the EEC at the time for bilateral issues, like Greece did to North Macedonia. Imagine another one took the veto relay and yet another one after that. And imagine that 18 years passed like it did for North Macedonia since 2004 when it applied for EU membership. It would have been 1994 and Greece would be still waiting in line to join in the, the EU. And others too would be waiting, Spain, Portugal, you know, let, let alone Malta, Cyprus and the former European communist countries. They would all still be waiting in line in this counterfactual history. It would be 1994 and pundits would tell them, you know, maybe in the next decade, uh, some of you will become members. So if lucky, Greece would join the EU in 2004 when it hosted the Olympic Games. And others probably much later, maybe they would be still waiting. So is it difficult to imagine? I don't know, but this is our story in the Western Balkans. But, 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 but let's leave past in the past. Let's turn to the future because this is the purpose of this conference. And I think, you know, with some of the colleagues, some of which are present here as well, with Zoran, we have repeated ad nauseum what, we, what the EU can do to improve the accession process. So I don't wanna do this now. We, we proposed introducing the qualified majority voting in the accession talks, uh, considered reforming the process entirely. Even just recently, um, uh, building on um, our own proposal with Zoran and Adi Cerimagic from European Stability Initiative, the Center for European Policy Studies uh, proposed an elaborate uh, reform of the accession process to stage the accession. So all this is on the table, but I, I, I want to talk about what can the candidate countries do to improve their chances of becoming a member in a foreseeable future? First, and I think this needs not to be said, uh, they have to be serious about reforms. But this is also not what I want to talk about because it's more obvious, uh, but also because examples of North Macedonia and Albania uh, lately show that sometimes even being serious about reforms is not enough, clearly. Um, our recent research uh, on the French public opinion towards enlargement of the Western Balkans shows that uh, the more experienced citizens of the European Union, and in this particular case, France, have with the Western Balkans, the more they will support its integration into the European Union. So I don't know if the organizers can show a slide that I shared, the second one uh, uh, here uh, to everybody following the, my presentation. If not, I will just continue. 
uh, but basically uh, uh, the, the our opinion poll for urban focus groups in France showed that at least proportionately the people that know somebody who comes from the Western Balkan six countries or that have had an experience of travel to the Western Balkans, uh, disproportionately, this group of people fall uh, within the group that supports EU accession of these countries in France. It's disproportionate. So uh, I think what serious pro-enlargement campaigns in the EU member states by the candidate and potential candidate countries can make a world of difference, together with, of course, being serious about the reforms. Uh, prior to 2013, when Croatia joined the European Union, Croatia poured millions in its advocacy campaign towards EU membership of the country. It was mainly uh, to boost the tourism of the country. So, you know, the unusual sight in Brussels and other EU capitals would be uh, images of Croatia on the public transportation, on buses. I think that this such campaigns when it comes to Croatia, did more than anything else to normalize the image of the country with uh, the EU uh, member states at the time. So uh, the, the, the images and the prejudices about the war that people associated uh, with the country in the early 1990s quickly disappeared to replace with uh, beautiful scenery, sandy beaches and so on. Uh, and what about the Western Balkans now in the present situation? It's not that they don't do such elaborate and, uh, and, uh, and big campaigns because they're poor. They sometimes just don't decide not to do them. Take Serbia, for example. In 2019, the Chamber of Commerce of the country gave $1.2 million for Washington lobbying firm to lobby for Serbia with the US government. And there is no comparable spending in any of the EU member states. Why? Well, in this particular case, uh, my guess is that Serbia's leadership doesn't want EU membership and that they are perfectly happy in the present situation. But, uh, but this is clearly not the, situ the case with other Western Balkans countries. And yet none of them conduct serious campaigns for its membership in the EU. Uh, they take, take, for example, Montenegro. By the criteria for joining the EU in 1979, all the Western countries would probably be fully ready for membership, but some of them, Montenegro, certainly. Uh, issues with any of the neighbors. And the skeptical EU member states is also favorable of its membership. I already mentioned the French public opinion survey that we conducted, and the Montenegro was the only country where um, uh, uh, the percentage of the population of France that is favorable of its membership or, or ambivalent about the issue was greater than the percentage that was against. So it would pay off to conduct serious campaigns. Montenegro, like Albania, can... have I'm, I'm finishing, this is the last one. So, so this is what I'm trying to say. Uh, 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 countries can do something themselves to improve their image and thus chances in joining the EU. This is not something that is done currently and I hope it will come. And I hope we can discuss but also other ways to, uh, uh, to accelerate the process. Thank you very much, Srijan. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Zoran Nechev uh, from Skopje. Okay, yeah. Uh, much of the things have been said or announced by Srijan already. So uh, I will go a little bit in depth so it can enter the, the report when it is sent or uploaded on, on the platform. So the first thing that already uh, Sergeant mentioned is the qualified majority voting in all intermediate uh, steps in the enlargement process. So that means that the council would not be blocked or the work of the council would not be blocked by an individual member state which try or misuses the process 
for uh, bilateral uh, bilateral uh, issues. Uh, by doing so, they still would be in charge of the process itself, as they will need to. Uh, they need a unanimity to open and to close the accession talks and afterwards the, the accession treaty to be ratified in the parliaments of the member states so they, the member states will still be in charge of the process but at least in the intermediate phases and that is for the opening of the clusters and closing of the chapters and meanwhile the the, the, the intermediate uh, phases they all would be in the hands of uh, uh, in the hands of of the majority of the member states, so they can they can uh, assess the situation as it is uh, realistically, but not only to reward a country, but also if it needs to be uh, some country to be uh, stopped, especially with the reversibility uh, aspect now in the new methodology. Uh, it would be much easier for the council to reach that kind of a decision. If if we would have the new methodology uh, prior, when we start, when the EU started accession negoti uh, negotiation talks with Serbia and Montenegro, uh, there would be several instances when they could have used the visibility um, uh, aspect, but they they haven't still used it. Uh, because it is uh, a bit more complicated. It's just easy not to open new uh, new chapters, as in the case with uh, Serbia, for example. That was the first concrete proposal. Uh, the second concrete proposal is that uh, if you have read recently the political article, when it comes to Digineer uh, and how things are done, that and also relate what was happening actually at uh, the Brdo uh, discussion, the, late, the latest EU Western Balkan summit, uh, the whole discussion about should, uh, should the declaration incorporate the word enlargement or not, or to put the, or to put the European perspective uh, of the region in the declaration. Um, the final consensus among the member states after several uh, days of discussion was to include the word enlargement in the declaration, but also on the insistence on, on uh, insistence by France, also to include the capacity of the union to absorb uh, new member states. That's the so-called absorption capacity. Well, when it comes to absorption capacity, my second proposal would be to increase the EU's absorption capacity by di diversifying the portfolios in which the Western Balkan countries are dealt with on a European level. Not focusing only on DGNIR, of course, DGNIR will be the primary institution with which our countries will, uh, will uh, communicate with, but also to, upper, uh, to open other venues on discussions. That means that uh, the relevant, I don't know, Ministry of, 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 of the Interior from, uh, uh, from Bosnia can uh, talk directly with DigiHome, for example. Of course, though, that discussion also will include one way or the other DigiNeer, but also to have respective personnel that will deal with the Western Balkan um, candidate countries directly. With that, you also, the EU will uh, increase their its own absorption capacities. Uh, and uh, can directly um, uh, respond to the to the countries at least that would, would like to join uh, the union uh, quicker uh, quicker than than the others in the Western Balkans. So uh, absorption uh, increase the EU's absorption capacities. The third proposal is that um, we integrate or the EU integrates the Western Balkan countries in. Uh, existing EU mechanisms. And, uh, and again, this goes with, in line with what is already being said, that we don't need to invent something new on which the Western Balkan countries uh, need to align with, but just to use the already existing mechanism by the Europe that exists for EU member states. Of course, we have been mentioned, we have been told many times before that you know, if you include the Western Balkan countries, then you will see 
how poor you perform when it comes to specific aspects, I don't know, about judicial performance. Uh, well, my idea is that it, that's irrelevant. Maybe we will underperform in the beginning. Maybe we don't, we don't know. But at least we are going to be, uh, we are going to be uh, in kind of a match with the EU member states. And then if, if we want to, to really, to try to, be, uh, to try to be as the best in the European Union, we would know what exactly we have to do. Therefore, my proposal, or, or also with this, this has been uh, discussed um, extensively uh, within BIPAC, uh, is that uh, we include the Western Balkan countries and measure their success uh, through uh, mechanisms like the justice uh, scoreboard, the new rule of law report, and also the uh, European semester framework, uh, of course, this goes also in line, especially for the European semester, goes in line with the new methodology, because the new methodology for the first time envisaged the economic criteria to be part of the fundamentals. So why invent, invent new ways in which we are going to assess these countries where we have the European semester uh, and um, we can see exactly in which way uh, they will perform uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to um, to, to, the, to the economy. And the, the final one, um, uh, we have been discussing a lot to increase the funds devoted to the Western Balkans. And we know how much one Western Balkan countries, uh, country gets vis-a-vis uh, -vis a member state, if, even if we compare just the member states in our uh, Southeast European region. So that's one element. The second element is to align um, all the existing uh, financial assistance rules and procedures with the EU structural uh, funds model. That's again a way that the EU should align its narrative when it comes to the Western Balkan countries as future members of the European Union. So when we start being eligible, and hopefully this also one of the proposals on the table that we can place is to open these structural funds uh, even before the actual accession, whenever these are these these funds are going to be open, these countries to have the capacity to absorb those. Uh, of course, again, in the beginning, and this is what we have heard even before, in the beginning, the absorption capacity will be low because it's a new way of uh, funding or mechanism, so the countries would not be would not be ready. This is why actually we want to open uh, these funds even earlier, because if you look at the performance of, of, of Croatia, I don't think that you know, the, 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 uh, the absorption capacity was the highest in the beginning. But in time, after years of using, we expect this absorption capacity to get, to get better. I will stop here. I think these are sufficient elements on which we can we can base the discussion even afterwards. Nicola, back to you. Thank you very much, Zoran. Uh, our next speaker will be Ms. Donika Amini, uh, joining us from uh, Pristina, Kosovo. Uh, Donika, please, you have the floor. Hi, Nicola. I'm very passionate. And if I have hearing, it's uh, my internet connection because it's apparently the day us as unstable as the future of the EU is constantly being interrupted. Um, we, I mean, I was very happy to participate in many events uh, which have been organized in the region. But uh, I mean, we have to be to be frank. These events uh, started with uh, with Zoran. So started unilaterally. It was in the Prespa uh, forum for dialogue in a way uh, when uh, for the first time we managed to, to, to discuss about the future of EU uh, unilaterally, meaning that uh, the EU couldn't be bothered to uh, formally uh, include Western Balkans in, in, a, in a conference which basically discusses the future of Europe, sending the message that we might not be as well considered to be part of it in the future. And we are not talking about the future of the EU, uh, future of Europe. So uh, I think it was very discouraging politically uh, to actually exclude Western Balkans after, you know, having us 
um, advocating for this for years. I, I, I remember, you know, when we started talking about this, it was back in 2014 and 15, we discussed about the importance of being included formally in this, in this debate. And we, here we are, you know, in 2021 and doing this unilaterally and doing this on the think tank level because it is partially the fault of our elites, but also of the EU for not, for not taking this uh, more seriously. The good thing is that uh, people in the Western Balkans are actually thinking that they can contribute in the Conference of Future of Europe. I mean, the discussions we had in, in the capital, starting from Skopje, but then we moved to Belgrade, Pristina, Sarajevo. Uh, then we, we basically got the message that we are ready to contribute and we are um, uh, mature enough to actually consider ourselves uh, as, as, um, as a provider providers and not just recipients in, in all kinds of level when it comes to the EU integration process. What we got from the focus groups in the region was that um, people see EU beyond enlargement. Of course, every discussion about uh, the future of Europe starts in the region starts with the EU enlargement, which is the elephant in the room. In Kosovo, it starts with visa liberalization, of course, because that's the most pressing issue as we speak. But then actually, you know, people have a clear vision on how the EU should look like beyond the enlargement. Um, what's important for the EU is to understand that uh, for years we have been talking about what is Western Balkans gaining from the EU uh, and what is benefiting from the EU. But we never twisted it around. What is the EU benefiting from Western Balkans? Uh, and uh, I will start with one element which is very important, it's EU actorness and EU normative power. I mean, let's be honest, if not in Western Balkans, where else? In Eastern partnership countries? I don't think that's going to happen. So if the EU wants to complete what it started in 2003, but also really prove that it's, it is an agent of change, it is a force that pushes the countries towards democratization, but it is also a very powerful geopolitical player because, I mean, this commission is all about geopolitics, then it really has to deliver in the Balkans. Uh, and uh, by completing the jigsaw in the Balkans, basically the EU proves once again that uh, it is powerful enough. Uh, the second element is that um, I hear, like every time we have discussions with EU level you know, uh, representatives, but also from member states, when you mention that the fact that you can do deepening and widening at the same time, you can see that they are kind of reluctant to think about it. Uh, and, and this is also a weakness of the EU, uh, which is showcasing in the case of the Western Balkans. I mean, if you look historically, I mean, uh, Sturgeon was, was very, very rightly, you know, started with an illustration is that the EU constantly did, did deepening and widening. It, it did reform, it did transform internally, but also did the enlargement at the same time. And now speaking from, coming from its expansion to resilience kind of sends a message that the EU is um, weakening and, and this, is, uh, this should be worrying, not just for the Western Balkans, but also for the EU. When it comes to what we can contribute, the first element that comes to my mind is uh, the willingness to participate. I mean, look at us, uh, unilaterally organizing events, gathering uh, online as well, to actually make a contribution, which we don't know if we are going to be listening or not. But our, our other colleague, our other source, Sergian, my story of is that, that the EU cannot afford not to listen to, to the Western Balkans in, in, in the event in Pristina. And, and this, is, uh, this is something that uh, the EU should keep in mind. The second element which I uh, constantly mention is that look at how perfectly fine the EU uh, cooperates with Western Balkans in security. So if you look at the, how the EU picks and chooses uh, what, how to, to uh, extend cooperation with Western Balkans, but uh, and, and picks you know the most beneficial and most pressing uh, of, uh, sectors and fields. The security is really one of the of the uh, examples that would illustrate it. Uh, security cooperation between the EU and Western Balkans is quite solid, and this is where you know my 
my strongest point is that we really can contribute. If you look at the CSDP missions, even without being part of the EU, with third party contracts and, and, and agreements, Western Balkans is a security provider. It participates in many uh, EU led missions. And it's very important, even uh, those missions, you know, in which, for instance, I think it's Altea mission in which uh, countries like North Macedonia and Albania contribute in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So basically, it not only goes globally, but also in the region, which is an agent of, of security, uh, of cooperation in the security uh, sector. Uh, but also, like, uh, it is very interesting to see how the EU, without even having an FBI agreement with Kosovo in, in, in the case of, of uh, fighting um, uh, extremism and, and a violent extremism and terrorism, it actually extended cooperation with Kosovo as well, bypassing all potential uh, uh, problems that the EU has vis-a-vis -vis Kosovo when it comes to uh, um, uh, the recognition of its uh, statehood. So this is one of the elements that is the strongest one, illustrating that the Western Balkans can make the EU stronger and not weaker, as you know, the message is being, in a way, uh, sent to the EU, that Western Balkans is something that is keeping the EU down and dragging feet of, of, of the EU and, and being an obstacle in, in this, you know, the EU project, which, uh, 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 according to them, is perfectly uh, functioning perfectly fine. And then there is a third element. We really care and we know. We are going through this process quite recently. I mean, look at what happened in, uh, with, with Brexit. Basically, people within the EU forgot how important it is to be there and how important this project is. And uh, this has been best illustrated with the case of, of Brexit. Uh, in our case, it's really we are the last ones who are going through this process and we understand how hard it is and how difficult it is to go through with reforms. And you know, we understand the importance of democratic transformation, but also being part of the union, which is uh, uh, represents some values and principles. Uh, it was very important to see how many people from Western Balkans through the focus groups saw the EU as a union of values saw it as a force of democratization and, and saw it as a source of you know, solidarity, uh, equality. So basically we are the last ones who are going through this process and we can really bring a fresh uh, approach within, within the union. So uh, my main message is that uh, first you should stop thinking about Western Balkans as something that is draining the energy of the EU, that is only benefiting from the EU without giving anything back, because there is a transaction and the EU it has a lot to gain from the region. Uh, here it is also to uh, important to mention economic cooperation beyond security and of course, you know, us really helping the EU to complete what they started in 2003 and making the EU a geopolitical actor uh, as the EU actually aims to be. So these are my initial intervention with three main points. But uh, the most important one is that the citizens of, of Western Balkans see the EU be beyond enlargement. Of course, they, they, they see the enlargement as the elephant in the room, but also have concrete ideas on how the EU should improve. And I think this is the main message that the EU should get, that the Balkans is mature enough, not just only to receive, but also to be able to deliver and to give to the EU. Uh, thank you very much, Donika. I would just like to correct you um, on one thing. Uh, this concrete event actually was, uh, in a way, assisted by the European Union. So there is some desire to, 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 to join, you know, to, to, to have the Western Balkans as a part of this process. So it's not that there is no ambition whatsoever of this kind. Uh, uh, but thank you very much, well, nevertheless. I really have to put here in the lectures start always because but this is back to, as Yannis said, and I think, you know, this is the best way of cooperating. Society has a lot, and most of the people, income and income, society, like we did in the process and many other processes that were equally important. But this is a message that we are not fully included in it. It's really, you know, say something about how they Western Balkans, also the part of the No one in Kosovo, I believe this is the case in other countries as well, even discusses about the topic here from the 
Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, next speaker will be Ms. Uh, Selma Prodanovic, uh, joining us, uh, I believe, from, from Vienna, so for the, for the European Union, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Ms. Prodanovic, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I think uh, you can hear me, please. Yep. All right. So, um, yes, uh, I am based in Vienna and uh, in the meantime, a uh, European EU citizen uh, coming from Sarajevo, from, from Bosnia, and having gone uh, through a transition myself in, the, in many different ways. But what I would like to talk about here today is uh, what was uh, mentioned already, and Donika has just uh, mentioned it again, it is how much um, the region can contribute to the EU. And I would like to put another perspective to the whole story, which is a business perspective. Um, I am myself an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur and an investor, and uh, been working in the field uh, throughout Europe in many different ways, supporting entrepreneurs and investors. And the reason why I believe in entrepreneurship is that entrepreneurs are people who create solutions to problems. This is what drives them. This is what they do is that some, there's a problem that they see every day and they decide that they're gonna do something about it and they create a business around that problem. And so to say, sell that solution on the market. And I believe strongly in the power of the region, in the people, in their hunger, to create in their hunger to do, in their capabilities of creating solutions beyond the usual. We know that the more problems you have, the more issues you have to solve, the greater things and solutions you create. So this is the main point coming from the business side is that what we're seeing worldwide with trends is, is um, one, that countries and boundaries in terms of countries um, have less and less meaning. We are looking, when we look at the startup world and the creation of, of, of benefits and values there, we see that cities are becoming important. And we have, as we know, immense and fantastic startup hubs in each of the cities, um, uh, main cities in the, um, in the Western six countries. Western Balkan six countries. And we know, and I've been there working also with GIZ and other organizations throughout the region, that there are fantastic entrepreneurs creating solutions that everybody needs, not just in the Balkans, but across the world. And we are part of that. And this is how can we transfer that benefit, those solutions into the um, European Union or make it a European solution, because that's what matters when we look at the larger um, picture. And if we look at China or the US, honestly, they don't care it's, if it's EU or Europe, it is just not them. So it is, let's make sure that we can see that as a larger region and to make sure that we say that all of these benefits, all of these solutions, all of these startups are coming from Europe. As such, the second thing is that we see the world of startups really moving towards the solutions towards the sustainable development goals, which is again a global story. So how, how can the Western Balkans contribute to solutions that are created to solve and to reach the sustainable development goals by 2030? An important part, because the sustainable development goals cannot be reached by each country. We only, if we work globally, can we reach and, and achieve that. So how can we look at the larger picture and stop looking at countries and nationalities and try to see it as really as Europe and try to really move it towards a global picture where we are benefiting or people across the, the region are benefiting to the European solutions that we have. Um, it is an, a fact and we know, and if you're interested in that, that's uh, very easy to, to uh, check, is that uh, there are so many great um, solutions or grow, so many great startups across the region. And when I look in one of my roles, I'm the vice president of the European Business Angel Network, which is a network gathering um, business angels from across 50 countries and also from the Western Balkans, because it doesn't matter when you're an investor, you're investing into the best solution, into the best business, into the best startup, best people. And the Western Balkans do have an amazing number of fantastic people. So looking at it from a perspective of business angels, it doesn't really matter where the startup comes from, where the solution comes from, where are the founders, it is which solution is really profitable, which solution is worth on the market, which solutions 
are really um, uh, global solutions that you can contribute to and, and work upon. And the point, just to make it really short and to say, what is it what I would like to see as next steps is that each of the, anybody listening in here and uh, um, is to empower people to start companies, to start startups, to create solutions that are needed, not only in a city, in a region, but across the globe. Secondly, to, so the first one being empowering, secondly, is supporting those that they can really develop. And we've seen there's a lot of great initiatives also coming from the EU uh, in the region. And thirdly, investing into these startups. Imagine the world without the Googles and the Amazons and all of them. These were startups. These were companies that were started in a garage and kind of started with a vision, with an idea, with two or three people. And that's how it all starts. But you have to support them for them to grow. And I would really like to see more support coming in on a pure business point of view. Because when you have people that create solutions, they feel empowered and they can deal with problems that, are, that the Western Balkans are now confronted with in a totally different manner. At the moment, everybody's focusing on the problems. And I wish we could so much more focus on the great solutions, on the great people, on the great founders, creativity and innovation that exists and is coming from the Western Balkans and see that as a benefit into the region. That's all for me. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Prodanovic, for this uh, different perspective uh, on the Western Balkan contribution to the European Union, which we really rarely see on civil society events here in the, in the Western Balkans. So thank you very much for this. Our next speaker will be Ms. Dalibor Kaujarevic, joining us from uh, Podgorica, Montenegro. Uh, Ms. Kaujarevic, you have the floor. Hello uh, to everybody. I hope we can hear each other. Okay, I would like to start with reminding us uh, all on several findings uh, from Ipsos research, which was conducted in 2020 in six countries of the region for uh, the European Fund for Balkans, if I recall well, which indicates that there is overwhelming support of the citizens um, uh, for uh, EU membership, um, some, uh, something uh, above the 80%, meaning that people in the region obviously see the road to the EU as needed change uh, for getting better quality of life, uh, governance and economic performance. Also, uh, because of all of the skeptics, I believe it is important to highlight the data that citizens assess as positive um, EU role in national um, uh, political and economic reforms. At the same time, citizens are in majority dissatisfied with their country's progress towards uh, the accession process as well as this, and that has been heavily misused by the political elites in the region uh, who um, very uh, well know how to protect their um, political monopolies of power and in that respect um, are able to um, able to, to swing some of the messages that we hear from the EU if they are not uh, clear enough. When it comes to the specific recommendations in order not to overlap with the colleagues, I think it would be very important that the EU is putting more focus on other actors in the countries. Um, when I'm talking about other actors, uh, of course, the negotiations are done with the institutions, um, uh, but civil society remains um, very important specifically in the region. And um, uh, the uh, next um, EU country report should actually link the relation of the government towards civil society as one of the things which should be measured whether th that they are making a progress or not. And if there is a backsliding that they could actually identify that that should have certain political consequences um, for the state as well as uh, uh, within some other benefits that they could actually expect if not so. Also, um, we didn't speak about that. I think that the climate in the region is um, very um, negative when it comes to the possibility to have argument-based dialogue and that it was to the great extent um, boosted by the 
political elites and i think that one of the issues that the eu should pay attention is uh, to um, stress the importance of this zero um, uh, tolerance for the hate speech actions against the civil society activists um, and all of these smear campaigns because they are limiting space um, uh, for the development of the critical thinking and uh, thus for the development of the society from inside them and finally I think that it is very important that um, EU provides um, um, uh, sustainable both financial and political support to the civil societies, uh, civil society organizations. In that respect, I'm talking that the civil society organizations, not the project, should be supported. And that um, uh, we have recently also seen uh, the visit of the um, president of the European Commission to the region, but there have been uh, no meetings with the civil society representatives. There have been meetings with some of the um, leaders that are not actually mainstreaming um, European values within the country. So I think that that kind of the balance should be also made uh, in order uh, to encourage society as a whole to be more engaged and not only to wait for the other actors to to change the things that would actually help the eu to meet these great expectations of the citizens of the region but that would help us um, at the field also to be more empowered and to be more supported by the other citizens within our daily work and within the missions that we have. Thank you very much, Ms. Udarevic, uh, for your contribution. Uh, our final speaker will be Ms. Dafina Petsi, joining us here from uh, Tirana, Albania. Ms. Petsi, you have the floor. Thank you. Greetings to all of you, and just a piece of confirmation that I'm being heard. Yeah? We can hear you, yeah. Great. Actually, uh, it is difficult to speak uh, the last, because uh, for me it's important not to use these minutes to um, to again repeat what, uh, what the colleagues shared. I have been following very carefully um, the events taking place in Ohrid, Skopje, Sarajevo, Pristina and Belgrade. And, um, but not only, I mean, there were several uh, forums, conferences trying to tackle this issue and trying to give a real contribution of bringing Western Balkan countries and especially civil society much nearer to the process of consultations in regard of, um, uh, of the Future for Europe conference, but also the developments that um, will uh, continue after it. And I can mention here several of them. The, it's the Blood Strategic Forum, Young Blood Strategic Forum, Tirana Connectivity Forum, the Fundamental Rights um, Conference, which took place several, uh, let's say, days ago in different uh, countries of the European Union, and also several initiatives where uh, I can also um, say that some of the colleagues here are also part. And I think that it is um, increased sensitivity uh, to involve Western Balkan countries in a substantial way. I think partners across the region, but also beyond the region, um, do value uh, the importance of uh, the Western Balkans involvement in discussions, because uh, you cannot talk about the future without having involved there all the actors which will make that future. But on the other hand, I think that um, the challenge that we have is to properly articulate um, and smartly articulate um, our needs and our, our uh, uh, position in this. Um, I was not so enthusiastic after the Blood Strategic Forum and I heard the panels uh, of the leaders, their concerns, their issues, and it looks like what we uh, stand for and what they stand for doesn't uh, stay in the same line. Uh, I will um, remind here one of the things being said uh, in the one of the activities that you have organized in Sarajevo, uh, where the moderator stressed uh, uh, out the fact that there is an increased sensibility of civil society organizations, but also governments for uh, 
uh, constructive regional cooperation and also um, uh, trying to do our homework in a better way within our countries and societies, which this is, a, let's say, a sign of maturity. But on the other hand, um, it is also being, um, uh, being put in the context of uh, migration flows and the fact that the young generations are somehow detached from all these processes because of lack of trust, uh, lack of tools, uh, lack of participation and lack of willingness. Uh, we, we know already that uh, our region has a 2.46 uh, billion euro uh, loss due to the youth migration and also uh, the youth unemployment uh, rate in the region approximately stands at 35%. And this is something that cannot be neglected when we talk about these important processes uh, because we must know that uh, the most revitalizing part of a society uh, in my perspective uh, is, the, is the youth force, is the, is the young generation. And uh, they, in, let's say in the, um, in the pyramid of a society, they keep the most difficult place, uh, uh, having in the, on their shoulders uh, the future of the elder people, but also responsible for creating new families and ensuring, let's say, uh, the continuation uh, of, of the society as such. And um, I would um, bring another, let's say, topic uh, uh, on this uh, discussion, which is the economic and investment plan, uh, which sets out a substantial investment package uh, up to 9 billion euros for the, for the region. And um, uh, it will support uh, connectivity, human capital, uh, inclusive growth, um, twin green and digital transition, which is very important. And it was mentioned here as well. And when it comes to this human component, there, is, uh, there are several flagships, such as digital infrastructure, um, investing in competences of private sector and youth guarantee. And I want to uh, also uh, give some recommendations how to benefit from it, but also how to, uh, how to make young people more sensitive about these opportunities, these resources, and how can we use the most of it? Because it's true that um, the, um, the intensity of connections among Western Balkan countries in different levels, starting from the governmental side, business sector, civil society, media, and so on, has been strengthened in the frame of Berlin process. Despite the fact that it didn't have a financial backbone, it contributed a lot to create this, this knowledge and to create this sensitivity. But now we should be careful how to plan the steps and how to concretely materialize what we have been asking for years. So in, in first of all, related to what I said previously, I think that there is a need to improve the understanding of migration processes in Western Balkan countries and reshape the narrative about mobility. I think that we need to generate better statistics for labor migration and brain drain in Western Balkan countries and have a proper and serious uh, engagement in that. And when I say serious engagement, I don't expect it only from the governments. And to be honest, I don't expect it from the governments at all. Um, it's, to, uh, it's also the need to establish mechanisms that support inter-regional uh, mobility uh, and also seeing it in, uh, let's say, intersectorial. Because yeah, we have, for example, a, a concrete result from uh, Berlin Process, which is the Regional Youth Cooperation Office. And it's great for its mission and what it's going to deliver. But what we understand is that we have to generate uh, sector-based jobs for our young people. We have to um, get more engaged or uh, create centers of excellencies for different, let's say, public policies, for different sectors of development, to see what we have in common and to co-develop together. So, okay, let's use that very good example that is built, but let's not stop it there. So we need to, to develop, to, to take these good practices and also develop other sectors um, to encourage circular migration, which to be honest, I have seen uh, uh, an increase in sensitivity coming from the governments, uh, but not some serious actions because serious actions come from um, serious commitment to uh, properly analyze the situation. Um, I listened before to one of the speakers uh, talking about solutions and I fully agree that the private sector is um, one of those sectors which is uh, most eager to find solutions, but I think what we have been facing during uh, these years, and especially as a young person, is that we have been creating problems for the solutions that were offered. 
Mm -hmm. You know, it was, uh, let's say, several years ago, uh, been talking uh, very, uh, very often in Albania about um, radicalization and, and extremism. And in that, it, it came from, from, from above, it came top down. And you could see youth organizations and civil society organizations adopting projects and initiatives to tackle radicalization, which really, it was not an issue. Mm? We have other issues. So we have been losing time and energy by creating problems for certain uh, solutions <laughs> that are given to us in order to go back down, listen to people, use more of this bottom-up approach and make sure that people are being heard in the processes. I think this is a lesson learned also for European Union, but because of all that bureaucracy that it represents, and thanks God that it has it, um, if things there are much more difficult to be changed. So our attitude, our requests need to be more specific. The way how we deal with our people and with our society and how we articulate our interests must be true and well-based in the real needs. And I think this is the responsibility of youth organizations, civil society organizations, research institutes, and so on and so forth. And I also stress out the need for bilateral cooperation between diaspora and the countries of origin especially when it comes to external expertise, research, development, and sectors with the potential of development, such as information and communication technology, tourism, agriculture, energy, education, and transport. It's all about uh, this, uh, this scheme that I mentioned before. It's, uh, it's all about to, to get the best of use from the economic and investment plan and to make sure that youth has a stay and a stay in the uh, service uh, that uh, would be, let's say, active in order to bring this, this plan uh, into reality. One of the key uh, things. I'm sorry, uh, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but we have run out of time. I have to stop you here, yes, uh, so we would have time for the for the questions. I'm really sorry. Uh, so uh, I would like to encourage all of you watching us through uh, the YouTube channel uh, of European Western Balkans or the Facebook page to ask any questions if you if you have them. In the meantime, I would like to ask each of my panelists one question, and we have around one minute per question, which is going to be really hard to to implement, but I, I am going to be really strict about this this time. Uh, so let's begin going back to Mr. Cvic. Uh, how, do you, how do you think that we could, uh, let's say, explain to the citizens of EU member states what would they gain by Western Balkans becoming members of the European Union? Is it only the pictures of beaches and the presenting a good image of the region, or there is something we can do to explain to them their concrete benefits? What would they gain in their everyday lives, or let's say, in the long term, due to the Western Balkans joining the European Union? I just I want to ask you to try to wrap it up in one minute so we would have time for each panelist. Well, thank you for your question. Uh, it's a very pertinent one in the sense, of course, I mean, not every country has beaches in the Western Balkans, and uh, this might not be an appropriate strategy uh, in every single member state, uh, you know. But I, I just uh, think that, uh, you know, to reply directly to your question, I think it's first of all, really about, uh, uh, you know, normalizing the image of these countries, you know, showing them as they are. And I think that that's what I was, the argument I was trying to make, that already makes a world of difference, you know, when uh, when you read uh, the posts of, say, French right-wing politicians and how they imagine Kosovo to be, you think that, uh, you know, um, probably it's clear that they have never been there, first of all, you know. So I think already that makes a big difference. The second thing is really uh, uh, several years ago, we conducted a, uh, a much smaller survey of Germany. And what we uh, concluded is that, for example, Germans have a pretty good um, understanding of their own country's economic interests in the region. So I think, you know, explaining that and building upon, um, you know, also what Selma was talking about, uh, Austria, for example, as well, or Italy, or the countries who clearly have a net benefit from cooperation with the Western Balkans that would have even more if these countries were to join the European Union. So. So I think, you know, not let alone the, the surrounding uh, EU member states or Greece 
that are sort of left uh, in a pocket uh, outside, uh, you know, having these six countries that do not belong to the Union um, and north to its borders. So I think, you know, all this clearly needs to be explained to the citizens of the EU member states, but, but first of all, you know, really showing the region in, in its real light. And I think that would really automatically make a big difference. Thank you, Srijan. Uh, uh, Mr. Nechev, so you have spoken about uh, uh, basically integrating the Western Balkans uh, in the existing EU mechanisms and, you know, increasing the capacity of the absorption of the EU. Do you think that this would improve, on the one hand, the EU accession process, on, and on the other hand, the performance of these countries when they actually join the European Union? Is, is this what you wanted to, to, to say? Is this the benefit from these suggestions? Yeah. That's the overall benefit. So, uh, you know, you need, the EU need to treat these countries as future member states of their own union. And what is the best way to, to you know, to integrate them or to make them ready uh, to, to become a genuine member of the European Union is by including them in all these mechanisms that already exist. And then to see or to help them in the process, making up this, you know, better on the ladder, not to be uh, last, but to be among the first ones. And by showing that and also comparing them with the best and the brightest in the European Union, then it's easy to incorporate them. You will see that, you know, maybe some countries will be lower on the ladder, someone will be uh, up on the ladder, but then you can say like, aha, look what North Macedonia is standing when it comes to judicial independence, well, just compare it with the country that is currently blocking it, Bulgaria, look at their parameters. They're in, the other ones are out. Or that's just one example, like, you know, there are many, uh, there are many, there are many others. But actually, that is, uh, that is the, uh, let's say, uh, that is the thing that we want to, to achieve with incorporating these countries in the existing uh, mechanisms. Uh, Ms. Amini, we have heard uh, a few of our speakers uh, talking about the civil society and the role of civil society, its impact uh, not only in the accession process, but also uh, basically talking about uh, the future of the Western Balkans in the EU for, for years. Uh, how do you think that the civil society can maybe contribute to the future of Europe, even putting aside the governments and the formal state of the accession process? What can we as a civil society do in this, in this regard? Thanks very much. It is something that I'm pushing forward and pushing important things I mean, just look at the hard work. I'm sorry, I had to interrupt you. We have some technical problems. I'm not sure if other people can hear you perfectly because I cannot. Maybe just me. How about the other panelists? Okay. okay. There is some problem. Maybe you should speak louder or uh, close to the microphone. Oh. <laughs> I saw Zola. You should be louder. I think uh, civil society has been attracted by their. Okay, so one of the problems we obviously have here in the Western Balkans is internet connection. This is something where, you know, the EU could contribute to the Western Balkans in maybe the future. Uh, while we wait for Nonika to, to be, be back, be back uh, because I believe she's still frozen here on my screen, I wanted to ask the same question to Ms. Uljarevic about the civil society and its role. What can the civil society do putting aside the, uh, the formal state of the accession process? I think it can contribute a lot, uh, primarily the part of the monitoring of the work of the authorities and also providing shadow reports um, and inputs for the European Commission, which can be very valuable for the realistic assessment of the state of the affairs. And this is why that should, the civil society should be strengthened for that. And um, I think that civil society is the one which is constantly pushing to see substantial sustainable transformation of the countries of the region into the societies of functional rule of law. And um, this, this is also interest of citizens and this is interest of the EU. 
Thank you. Uh, back to you, Donica, if you can hear us this time and we, if we can hear you this time. Yeah, yeah, Perfect. great. Well, as I mentioned, IAD has been important to the process. We have been part to find uh, uh, I mean, for if you look at the no whole synchronous or the was a whole all the much as the IAD can the community did actually. We have been each agreement that has discussed the summit as a meeting uh, for the Western Bulk. So the high is, I mean, look at us, this is the help of the skills coming from the community, connecting with each other. It's also operation by the Western has never been interrupted with the crisis that might have had uh, in the past or now. Uh, so, I this group which is also uh, uh, important for the uh, men who are still track uh, in the dialogue research uh, or many other things that have been sort of uh, the support of society, hopefully it is not society, seriously, uh, it's uh, an important and of course supporting them. Because many times it has teamed up to the local government and actually have been working with them, which often been, you know, as productive as a tech. It's in Libya when sometimes in the states of the or the uh, quite was the and the search for the most structure. So uh, this approach uh, should be uh, uh, really achieved. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Ms. Prodanovic, you were talking about a completely different perspective uh, uh, than what we are used to hearing uh, here on similar events in, in the Western Balkans. And uh, my question for you would therefore be, can we sell this uh, 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 to the European Union and its member states and the citizens, this entire uh, benefit coming from entrepreneurship, uh, startups, uh, economic benefits uh, stemming from uh, membership of the Western Balkans inside the EU. Is this something that could contribute to changing this image that the Western Balkan countries have in the EU? Is this something where you think there is potential to do something? Um, thank you very much for that question. It is uh, definitely an opportunity. Uh, I'm not sure if you can yeah. hear me. We, we can hear you, yeah. Okay. Uh, it is a great opportunity. Of course, the civil society has been doing a tremendous work um, in the, the last uh, couple of decades. But I do believe that it is about really showing off all the opportunities and possibilities that exist in the Western Balkans. And it's not just about somebody wanting the Western Balkans, but it is looking at the EU investing into the Western Balkans and having a return on investment. I know it sounds very simplified, and it is a very simplified equation I'm talking about right now, but it is about looking at it from a different perspective. And the same way we have created a series of interviews on uh, us together discussing that today, it is what is it, what the Western Balkans can contribute to the EU that needs to be put forward and explain on every occasion that it's not the EU just helping out, but it is really a worthwhile opportunity for the EU coming from the Western Balkans and enlarging the whole concept because Europe is completely with China and the US and not within Europe. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Petsy, we could say that uh, youth in the Western Balkans is already integrating into the European Union because people are leaving, young people are leaving one by one, becoming EU citizens eventually. But what can we do to 
integrate young people in the Western Balkans in the European Union in the sense that they are uh, aware of, uh, of, uh, of belonging to, 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 to Europe and, you know, like discussing, debating and finding, uh, you know, answers to all these questions which are Europe-wide, not only local, not only Western Balkans issues, but something that the problems that entire Europe uh, faces at the moment. What can we do to, 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 to change the perspective of youth, to make them feel like European citizens, even at a time when they're not formally citizens of the European Union? Uh, first of all, uh, we have to be honest with our young people. Uh, when we explain several developments, initiatives, help them to have a critical thought about um, the processes that the government of different societies are going to aim at integration itself. This is something we can do with the magic stick. It has to be systematic, it has to be in daily basis. And uh, it's the humble work that we should do in our working countries, in our society, and in our local level of living, in the communitarian level. I would also say that um, we must ensure a certain space and place for civil society and young people in the economic and investment plan that they were taking. And ensure accountability and transparency of the projects under the frame of uh, economic and investment plan. And I also would uh, hope to for those which are listening to us, especially young people, that through the Western Balkan cooperation platform, we will uh, open a new, let's say, um, uh, advocacy campaign in order to inform that better and to make sure that young people are involved in this important discourse and dialogue. So, uh, empowerment, engaging, connection. This is what we can do for our young people to make sure that they feel Europeans. Really. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And um, here, I would like to thank uh, all of our speakers for their time and their invaluable contribution to, to this event and uh, for the Western Balkans overall contribution to the conference of the future in Europe. And of course, thank uh, big thanks to all of you who are uh, watching us on YouTube and Facebook and all those of who will uh, watch us here in the future. I believe that uh, a lot of important things were said during this event and that will, they, they will prove useful for uh, the future of the Western Balkans EU relations and the EU accession process of the Western Balkans. So thank you once again and uh, we sure hope to see you uh, on some uh, other opportunities in the future. Thank you.